Okay. Hey guys, welcome to the Disruptors, the podcast where we get quite literally the folks that are disrupting the future and the way we think about it on. Today we've got one of them, Glenn Lowry. Thanks for coming today, Glenn. You're welcome, Matt. It's good to be with you. And it's good to have you on as well. I wanted to get you on. You first came to my attention from the intellectual dark web guys, and I wanted to dive into that movement a little bit in terms of the the smaller scale public intellectual that suddenly becomes mainstream. Take me through take me through your story a little bit and how you became associated with those guys. Well, I'm not really associated with them, at least not yet. I haven't done anything in collaboration with uh, Jordan Peterson or Sam Harris or any of those guys, Joe Rogan. I know those names. I listen to some of their podcasts. I admire their work. Uh, I've read uh, the 12 Rules for Life, and I've been affected by it. Uh, Sam Harris and I did one of his podcasts, and we talked about uh, race and uh, crime and violence and police and stuff like that, and that, that went over very well. But the way the reason that I think I'm mentioned in the same sentence with intellectual dark web types is that I've uh, been running a podcast for a number of years now uh, at a site called bloggingheads.tv. Uh, and there I carry on conversations with people, I suppose, not dissimilar to the way that you carry on conversations with people about books and ideas that I think are interesting and um, I've had an ongoing uh, discussion at that uh, podcast with a friend of mine, a colleague called John McWhorter, who's a professor at Columbia University. We're both black African-Americans. We call ourselves the black guys at bloggingheads.tv. And we kick it around, you know, about everything we started when Obama was running for president the first time. OK, that's going all the way back 10 years. Uh, is uh, when John and I started doing these podcasts with the black guys at Blogging Hit. That's TV talking about whatever Black Lives Matter might be up to or whatever uh, issues of racism is going on in the world, you know, at a Starbucks or something like that. Or some of these uh, terrible incidents that happen when, you know, uh, people are uh, shot down by uh, police officers. They're unarmed and they're black. Uh, we talk about those things and many other things besides the issue of affirmative action, uh, which is controversial and uh, often in the news, we talk about those things. Anyway, the long and short of it is the line of attack that John and I are inclined to take, and we are different people. He can speak for himself. But the line of kind of uh, reaction that we have to current day events that have to do with racial issues is often different from what one might expect from the black guys at bloggingheads.tv, which is to say we're we're kind of contrarians. And again, my friend John McWhorter can speak for himself, but I think I can say this much. Uh, we don't uh, follow the herd. You know, we, we uh, sometimes step out of line. Uh, we're sometimes prepared to question, is everything really racism? We're sometimes prepared to call somebody out when they say something that we think is kind of dumb. Um, we, we think the, um, John has this thing that he, he says, you know, there's a religion out there, the religion of anti-racism, the li religion of politically correct, uh, you know, affirmation of whatever the nostrum of the day might be uh, concerning racial issues. There's certain things you know you're supposed to say about you know, microaggressions or about white privilege or about white supremacy or whatever it is. And we don't say those things. We think for ourselves. We will say those things sometimes, but often we will be saying, I wonder, what is this guy ta Coates talking about when he says that there's no future for black people in America, that we are perpetually and forever going to be a subordinate uh, subjugated, uh, despised, and didn't he just notice that? And then we'd go on to say whatever it was that contradicted the uh, this particular piece of zeitgeist. So that is how I think Barry Weiss, the writer at uh, the New York Times, did a piece on the intellectual dark web and uh, uh, called attention to um, our work a little bit. And uh, um, I think her name is Deborah Baum. I may be getting the name right. Uh, maybe not be getting the name right, but another journalist who uh, had a piece out there called uh, My Secret Love Affair with the Intellectual Dark Web or something like that, in which she mentioned our work at Blogging Heads as being indicative of a, you know, a kind of cutting edge, contrarian, pushing against the politically correct uh, grain, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, discourse. So 
in that way, I've come to be mentioned in the same sentence, but I, I don't know about a movement, uh, at least not yet. They got you listed on the website, so I think there might be something in the works. But in terms of in terms of why I wanted to have you on, I think that contrarian view is incredibly important. I imagine, although I'm not sure, is this because do you think you're like that because you're economist type mind? You're able to think about things logically as opposed to emotionally? Yeah. <laughs> in in brief uh, although those are involve stereotypes, we just relegated the entirety of the conventional, uh, politically correct sort of campus chic uh, discussion of a, cl a class of important issues, racial issues. We just relegated them to e the realm of emotion, and I just arrogated to myself the rubric of being uh, a rational reasonable thinker based on evidence, whatnot. but I think there's something to it. <laughs> uh, economists are taught from day one that there's no free lunch, and people laugh. They think that that's just some kind of uh, poster, some kind of right-wing, you know, uh, slogan. No, 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 it's a deep insight, and I mean, it captured in a pithy phrase, there's no free lunch. That means that whatever the cost and benefits are, you need to take them into account before you decide whether doing something is a good idea. There's nothing for free. Everything has alternatives that might have been done instead of the thing that you're doing. You have to think through what the alternatives are. There are always unintended consequences to large-scale social interventions. There are reasons why people do things. They're not just people are not just uh, evil or, or or just intrinsically racist. I mean, people are uh, usually acting more or less in their own self-interest as they understand it, based on the information that's available to them and so forth. Uh, so there, there is something about economics that I think predisposes one to be suspicious of, uh, you know, monocausal, one-dimensional, uh, you know, kind of uh, 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 accounts of complicated phenomena. I should be concrete. I should give an example. So uh, police interacting with uh, young people, young men, uh, young black men. Uh, in urban areas. So, you know, the idea that uh, racism can uh, basically account for what it is that I'm observing there seems to me to be insufficient. Are there racist police? Of course there are racist police. There's also uh, a huge racial disparity in the incidents with which people are participating in criminal activities in certain places. Now, there are reasons for that. Uh, historical reasons, social, political, economic reasons. We can talk about it until the cows come home. I'm not saying that, you know, there's something wrong with the black people if I observe that the homicide rate amongst African-Americans is an order of magnitude higher. I'm talking about a factor of eight to 10, depending on the age bracket and so forth, uh, higher than uh, amongst African-Americans than amongst whites, just to give one kind of comparison. But if I'm a police officer policing a city, and this is a fact about the behavior of people in that city, it's very hard to imagine that I'm somehow not going to take that on board as I go about my activities. Now, of course, I should fight against, you know, uh, unjust bias. I shouldn't assume every black person I see is a criminal just because the, the black homicide rate is higher and so forth and so on. But surely when I'm pulling somebody over at two o'clock in the morning uh, when they've been driving erratically and I approach that uh, driver's side of that vehicle, I'm going to be on hyper alert to the possibility that something bad could happen to me. And the fact that the driver is black and is male and is under the age of 60 probably will factor into my thinking. And if that being the case, to call me a racist or to d dismiss what it is that I might say about that situation based upon some simplistic imputation of uh, anti-black motives to me, well, that's that's uh, simplistic in the extreme. I give one example. There are many examples that I could give. But that kind of thinking, which I do associate a little bit with being a social scientist and being a quantitative social scientist, does uh, militate against just mouthing of platitudes, which is what you will hear a lot of people doing when they talk about issues like this. Well, it comes down to empathy. If you're overly empathetic, you're only able to feel something. You're not able to rationally think about it. I think that's a big part of the problem that we have in society today is people feel things, but they're not willing to think or reason. Okay, I'm not going to argue with that. Let's get down to cases. For example, let's let's get into let's get into affirmative action. I know that's a, that's a big ticket item for you. It is. I've been writing about that since the beginning of my career. That was four decades ago, people. Long time. 
How do we how do we deal with that going forward? Because I, I mean, you're a professor now at Harvard. Harvard had their fair share of scandals when it comes to affirmative action and uh, Asian students. How can we think about this? And do you think we should have affirmative action? Not have affirmative action? Break break down your opinions and your your thoughts on the matter because you're much more educated than most on this. Thank you. Uh, I'm at Brown University right now. I was a professor at Harvard University for a number of years between 1982 and 1991. That's going way back. But I haven't been affiliated with Harvard for some time. But I do know the university and I know this case. Um, I don't know how much time we've got. I'll try to be succinct. Um, I'm of two minds about affirmative action. And it has to do, one, with the general acceptability or admissibility question. And then the other with the practicality and where do we go from here question. And I differ along those two dimensions. On the general uh, permissibility, is the practice of racial affirmative action inconsistent with the U.S. Constitution's 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause, or with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which is an act of Congress signed by President Johnson, which regulates discrimination uh, issues? I think it is, or at least it can be. It's, I would not presumptively and categorically rule out affirmative action based upon a constitutional or legal argument. It's racial discrimination. It's no different from uh, no blacks or no Irish need apply. I thought we were done with that. That kind of argument, I don't buy. I think that you can carve out an area within the law, and the Supreme Court has done this under its jurisprudence doctrine called uh, strict scrutiny. Affirmative action policies are consistent with the Constitution, the court has said in a number of cases, as long as they can pass strict scrutiny. And strict scrutiny means that the activity of a government which involves racial discrimination has to be narrowly tailored in order to advance a compelling public interest. So there are two dimensions to the test. Is the activity narrowly tailored, meaning to say, is there some non-discriminatory way of achieving the same objective that's at hand? If no, then it's narrowly tailored. And does it advance a compelling public interest? That is, is it being undertaken on behalf of something that is really important to the government? Now, the Supreme Court has held in the cases of higher education, um, most recently in the University of Michigan case, Grutter v. Bollinger, Gratz v. Bollinger. There were a pair of cases that came out of Michigan in the early aughts. I think they were decided in 2003. Sandra Day O'Connor wrote the uh, the compromise uh, opinion of, uh, I think it was a 5-4, but it might have been a 6-3 majority of the court. But in any case, uh, they've decided that the pursuit of ethnic racial diversity amongst the student body, when pursued not with a quota, but with the holistic evaluation of student applications that weigh a variety of factors and take race into account along with other factors, so long as it's narrowly tailored to advance the interest of creating diversity that's consistent with the Constitution. That was a long-winded way, but I'm just trying to tell you what the legal doctrine is. I'm okay with that. I'm not one of these people who's running around saying that um, one of these people, by the way, would include Justice Clarence Thomas of the United States Supreme Court. He's in the minority on these opinions. Uh, I think his view has to be taken seriously, but I'm not one of these people who run around saying uh, look, the letter, the letter of the law is very clear. No discrimination means no discrimination. Uh, equal protection of the laws without regard to race means what it says. Affirmative action violates that. I'm OK with the compromise that the court has uh, has, in fact, arrived at on the legal doctrine. So that's one point. Contrary to that, however, pushing in the other direction is my assessment about the pra practical implications of institutionalizing racial preferences as the device, a primary device for ensuring the presence of African Americans in competitive, uh, elite, highly selective intellectual academic venues like a Harvard University. Harvard admits like five or six percent of its applicants in recent classes. OK, so they're admitting, I don't know, eighteen hundred to two thousand students and they're getting, I don't know, thirty five or forty thousand applications. Um, the difference in the test scores, if we looked at only the academic qualifications of the students, I'm talking about what their GPA is in high school, I'm talking about how many advanced placement courses that they took in what disciplines, I'm talking about what their letters of recommendation say from their teachers, uh, and I'm talking about their scores on the SAT test or uh, the um, ACT, you know, these 
college entrance examinations that students take, the standardized examination. If you look at those data, the disparity in um, the preparation and the competitiveness, I'm talking about the academic qualifications of applicants between races, is vast. I'll just give one indication of this. These are rough numbers because I don't have the tape data right in front of me, but I, I'm, I'm quite confident that what I'm saying is close to being accurate. Uh, divide the applicants ranked by their academic index, that's their grades and test scores, into deciles. What that means is divide the entire population into tenths, ranked by the top tenth of the applicants, the second to the top tenth on down to the tenth of the top tenth, and ask the following question. What fraction of African-American applicants to Harvard fall within each tenth? Answer, roughly 2% of black applicants, 2.5% maybe, are in the top two deciles of the population of applicants ranked by academic index. That is to say, the top 2% of African, the top, sorry, that's, that is right. The top 2% of African-American applicants fall within the uh, top 20% of overall population. Likewise, roughly half of African-American applicants to Harvard have academic indices that fall in the bottom two deciles. Okay? That's saying 80% of all applicants present academic qualifications better than the median African-American applicant. So, so uh, that's a stunning difference. If you looked at the Asian applicants, about a third of them are in the top two deciles, and some like 5% of them are in the bottom two deciles. Okay. In order to get 12% to 15% in the most recent class at Harvard is 15% African American. In order to get 15% of the applicants African American, admits African American, when you have that kind of disparity in the test scores, you have to have huge differences in the likelihood that an applicant is admitted based upon their race. If you fall, for example, within the seventh decile, so that's from 70 to 80 percent of the, uh, you're, you're ranked between the 70th and 80th percentile of the distribution of applicants in terms of your academic index, and you're black, your chance of getting into the university is like 0.5. You got 50 percent chance of getting in if you're in the 70th to 80th percentile of the academic distribution of applicants. If you're Asian, your chance of getting in is like 5 percent. It's like a tenth of the chance of an African-American applicant getting in if you're falling in the upper tier but not quite in the top of the applicant distribution. Anyway, I could go on. The, the gap is very, very substantial. Now, here's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is even if the courts decide that affirmative action is legal, which they have done, and they may yet decide again in this Harvard case that's pending, even if they do, think about the implications of living in a world where to get into Harvard, an African-American student doesn't have to be, and everybody knows that he or she doesn't have to be anywhere nearly as distinguished in terms of their academic qualifications as an Asian student who's admitted to the university, or a white student for that matter who's admitted to the university, or to put that point in a different way, think about being an Asian applicant rejected at Harvard, knowing that your chances of getting in, even when you present the most excellent academic profile, are very significantly different than your chances of getting in would be if you belong to one of these other groups. <coughs> but let me focus on the position of the African-American applicant. Because um, the goal here, I thought, was supposed to be equality. I thought that the point of a civil rights movement and the point of a racial justice movement was to promote the equality of status and the equality of opportunity across uh, different racial groups. If we lock ourselves into a permanent regime where African Americans being at Harvard means they have to be treated with a significantly lower standard of evaluating their academic uh, qualifications before they're admitted, we're, we're, we're locking ourselves into a situation that is not equal, it's unequal. The fact of such huge racial differences in test scores is telling us something about the disparity in the development of the intellectual potential of these populations who are presenting themselves as applicants to a place like Harvard. I don't believe that African Americans are intrinsically, innately, intellectually inferior. I don't believe that. 
But people who insist that the only way that you can have racial diversity at a place like Harvard is if you use different standards to judge the qualification for admission of people based upon their race, different academic standards, different intellectual standards, would appear to suffer from the soft bigotry of low expectations about the ability of African Americans to compete. What I want to see is the gap between the qualifications of these populations narrow to the extent possible. Maybe it will never narrow to zero. I can live with that. I can live with the fact that the gap may never. There are plenty of disparities when we look around the world. If we look in the athletic world, we don't see every group represented at the same rate. If we look in the uh, medical professions, we see different ethnic groups who are overrepresented amongst the people who, pers who pursue those particular pursuits. There's no reason um, uh, that we should necessarily expect. Thomas Sowell, the conservative African-American economist at the Hoover Institution, has made this point in book after book after book. He keeps making a point because people don't seem to be getting it. The, the, the norm of equal group presence in every kind of human endeavor is silly. It doesn't make any sense. It's ahistorical. It's contradicted by the evidence in country after country after country after country. So there's no reason why we should necessarily expect parity. But we might uh, set as a goal narrowing the disparities of the sort that I have uh, just been describing. But we won't achieve that goal if we paper over the objective racial difference in the development of the intellectual potential of youngsters by using different standards to judge them in the arenas of the most intense competition like those of trying to get into a place like Harvard. So let me just get to a bottom line on that. You asked me what my views were about affirmative action. I said they had two dimensions. They were twofold. They were two-pronged. On the one hand, I reject the outright uh, a priori presumptive dismissal of affirmative action is inconsistent with anti-discrimination norms. I'm prepared to split the difference there and allow for the legality of affirmative action. On the other hand, as a practical matter, I think that the permanent dependence upon racial preferences as a way of ensuring the presence of African-Americans at places like Harvard is inconsistent with what ought to be the only long-term goal that we have uh, for race relations, which is equality, equality of standing, equality of dignity. It locks in inequality. It papers over disparities of development. Instead of addressing those disparities of development, challenging ourselves as a society and challenging African Americans as an ethnic group to up our game so that our people, I speak now about black people, are competitive in the modern world, the 21st century, fast moving, technological change going on all the time, uh, the cutting edge being advanced in these places. I mean, this is another reason why I say this. We're not talking about um, a social club. Harvard is not a day camp. We're talking about the cutting edge of intellectual activity. We're talking about research that's right at the frontier of the various disciplines. We're talking about some of the most talented people on the planet competing to get to the head of the queue. African Americans have to, at the end of the day, have as our goal winning in that competitive process, not being patronized. I'm sorry if I seem to be emotional, because I am emotional about this. Don't no, patronize good. my people. Don't presume that we're not able to compete. Don't say that, oh, I see, you're smart, but you're just not smart in the same way. You've, you've got leadership potential. We don't expect you to do calculus. I mean, come on. That's not equality. Uh, that may be the easiest path, the path of least resistance for certain educational administrators who simply want the problem to go away. They want, to, they want kumbaya, they want to be able to smile and say we've got diversity. We are a diverse and inclusive institution, you see. But when you go to the engineering school, when you go to the science departments, when you go to mathematics and applied mathematics and you don't see any black people sitting in those seats, how's that equality? So, uh, you know, that, that's where I'm coming from on that. And it creates a major problem, not just from the equality perspective, but also from a jealousy type perspective. Essentially it over, it creates emphasis on race where we want to be eliminating the emphasis on race because it shows us how we're different and it points out differences among us that create more problems than they solve. Well, I don't disagree with that because I stress that everybody is aware whether they speak about it or not about the differences in the qualifications that students are bringing into these venues. Everybody knows it. Everybody can see it. So uh, it, 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 it well may, um, it, it well may uh, 
put the wrong kind of emphasis on race and uh, and uh, promote a kind of dishonesty, a, a kind of underhandedness in a way, a kind of subversive uh, diminishment of the standards of distinction that we would otherwise want to use in assessing uh, who gets into the university, who gets uh, into the research lab, who gets into the graduate school, who is honored uh, as uh, being at uh, the forefront of the human, uh, rarefied human endeavor of uh, scholarship, scholastic enterprise at the frontier of human uh, striving. That That's, you know, uh, I don't think there's any substitute at the end of the day for us, to, uh, us being African-Americans to be able to cut it without a thumb on the scale. Easy for me to say, I got a PhD from MIT 42 years ago. People will probably write off what I'm saying is, oh yeah, he was a nerd, he was good at math and calculus, he thinks everybody has to be the same way. No, 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 but I can tell you this, 40 years ago, when I was going to places like Princeton, Caltech, and Stanford giving uh, seminars, I didn't see any black people in the room. I'm talking about economics research, econometrics, economic theory, mathematical economics. I saw a few black people in the room. Today, I go to these same places, giving the same kind of lectures, and I still see few black people in the room. So guess what? All the Afro-American studies departments in the world, all the third world centers in the world, all the affirmative action, all of the people of color coalitions, all of the counselors, advisors, and associate provosts and deans in the world for diversity will not put a single person in one of those seminar rooms. The only thing that will get them in there is mastery over the technical material at hand. The only thing that will bring about more equality and more representation of African Americans who, with respect in these venues, I'm not talking about selling newspapers or opening up a corner uh, bodega. I'm talking about getting a PhD in economics. I'm talking about getting your research published in the uh, uh, Journal of the American Medical Association. There is no substitute for performance. Affirmative action diverts us from the work that needs to be done to close the racial gap in performance. So I don't accept it as a permanent solution to the problem, even though I'd be prepared to entertain it as a transitional policy, you know, going back 35, 40 years, talking about how do we get out of an era of Jim Crow and overt racial discrimination against black people when these institutions had never been open to blacks. The idea that uh, you might want to do some extraordinary things in order to open the doors and to get some people in there and to shake things up is one idea. Going a half century down the line from the 1968, thinking that this is a way that we're going to be doing business uh, ad infinitum, going on indefinitely, and rationalizing that by, in effect, saying, well, you know, there was Jim Crow segregation and slavery, and we can't really expect black people to compete in the same way, but it's essential that we have their presence among us, and therefore, we're going to use a different set of criteria to assess uh, them as being fit for inclusion in this enterprise that we're engaged in is unacceptable to me as a permanent way of doing business. It's inconsistent with racial equality. And let's look forward 50 years. The technology that's coming right now in terms of self-augmentation combined with what we're learning more and more about health. You see the, you see the top echelons of society living longer and longer and you see the lower economic classes having shorter and shorter lives you see relatively the same thing happening when it comes to intelligence and iq and then with crispr genetic engineering and what we're the world we're moving towards how do we avoid having a world where people are incredibly different yeah and this of course goes beyond race racial differences and and uh, this is the kind of thing that Yuval Harari you've read his book no doubt mm -hmm. uh, Homo Deus uh, I've just been reading it with my sons uh, uh, my sons and I have a book club and their mom died and she was a big reader and the way that we kind of keep her spirit alive is that we share a book every couple of months we discuss it on Skype one kid lives in San Francisco the other kid lives in suburban Boston but the three of us have this little family book club and Yuval Harari's book Homo Deus is on our list, we're reading it right now. And uh, I, I mean, I, I hope your audience knows what I'm talking about. If not, they can just look him up. He's an Israeli historian, Yuval Harari, but uh, he's speculating about the future of humankind in the 21st century. 
and putting a lot of emphasis on the potential for biogenetic engineering and uh, so on, and also on for you know uh, advances in artificial intelligence and the integration of some of those systems with human bodies and things like that. And you know, do there are people who want to live forever <laughs> uh, or want their kids to be perfect. Uh, and have the resources and the sciences coming online to allow people to act on this impulse to to step in that direction. So I don't know how that intersects with race inequality and affirmative action, although it doesn't sound wealth good. access. So if you look at the richest portions of society, I, I I think I haven't looked at the stats, but based off of the stats I've seen in the past, I would imagine that the lower income is typically more correlated with being African. Actually, before we jump into that, sure, I've always true. I've always found the term African American to be incredibly derogatory. I think black is a better term because you have. Why would you have to have an adjective qualifier on the fact of being an American? That's just a quick side note. What are your thoughts? Oh uh, no, that's not a side note, man. This is a major issue in my opinion. Okay, let's hear it. The whole podcast. Uh, well, my thoughts are African-American is the conventional thing. And so, you know, there's going to be a brouhaha if we have a fight about what we call, you know, they used to call African-Americans Negroes. If you use that word now, it's a slur. You can lose your job. Somebody I read where I don't remember who used the word Negro and they were put in the dock. They were going to be fired because, you know, they had said an insulting racial slur. But that was the word as I as a kid that I always grew up thinking was the most respectable way to refer to the defendant, the descendants of slaves within the United States. Polity was Negro. But that that time has changed black and then African-American. So you say it's insulting. Put a qualifier in front of American. I agree with that. Uh, the. Uh, I mean, I've said this on more than one occasion in my own uh, little podcast. I've said, you know, here we are, African-Americans, blacks. Uh, we are citizens of, uh, you know, the most powerful nation on the planet and uh, the, the, a great and wealthy country. Uh, it's our birthright. We are Americans. Uh, witness how valuable being a resident of, not to mention being a citizen of this republic is to people who are trying to get here from every corner of the planet. That's why immigration is an issue. Uh, there's opportunity here in this country. It's an open society. Is it perfect? No, of course not. Reforms are always welcome. Let's talk about it. But looking around the planet, talking about the security that people have, talking about the opportunity to have your idea become a reality, to make a fortune, if that's what you're inclined to do, to uh, live in peace, to uh, pursue happiness, uh, it ain't such a bad place. OK, now we're citizens of this republic to take the stance that somehow the fact of our history, history being descended from people who had been enslaved, descended from people who had been sell, uh, relegated to a second class citizenship. That's a true history. To take the fact of that history as presumptively placing us in an antistic antagonistic posture vis-a-vis -vis our American national identities that we have to be presumptively outsiders, that we have to be necessarily in opposition to. If uh, somebody says, uh, I'm a patriot, I'm celebrating American nationalism, we're supposed to sneer. We're supposed to know that American nationalism is a bad thing. American nationalism is supposed to be equivalent to white nationalism. How silly, how silly is the idea? Now, you can have a critique of that, how silly is the idea? that affirming American nationalism necessarily entails some kind of white supremacist Nazism. That's silly, ahistorical, foolish. You can have a critique of nationalism. You can say that there should be uh, a world government, that borders should be uh, vanished. You can make that argument. I personally, Glenn Lowry, wouldn't be persuaded unless you had a lot to say that I haven't yet heard, but you can make that argument. But the idea that American nationalism is somehow necessarily white why did you concede that? Why did you give that ground? That was gratuitous. So, I mean, people are going to get mad at me because these things are so controversial. But I, I warned you that I'm a contrarian. When I see the NFL players taking a knee at the national anthem, I, I cringe. I do not cringe because I think their cause is unjust. Their cause is to protest police brutality and the mistreatment of unarmed African-Americans in the cities of the country. That's OK with me. That's a legitimate cause. What I cringe about is the conflation of the protest against that with the ceremony in which the, the American national 
ideals are being uh, are being uh, centered, centered uh, affirmed, celebrated. It's merely a ceremony, okay, in which all the people attended to the sporting event affirm their American nationality. Why make that the site of protest about a legitimate issue on which people can differ? But why make that as if the country was itself not worthy? And Colin Kaepernick actually said this. I'm not going to uh, salute a flag or affirm a country where uh, they uh, uh, not, are, are mistreating people of color. That doesn't define this country. Hello? That does not define the United States of America. Why would I take that position presumptively, gratuitously? Never mind the impact on the market, you know, how many people will turn off the NFL. How many contracts will I get from Nike if I take that stance? I, this is not a popularity contest. This is an argument about ideals and about principles. And I think the, uh, the principle or the ideal that African Americans, I use the phrase, I don't, you know, it's the, it's the term of art. It's the phrase that people are using. People who are black, black people, people who are Americans who descend from slaves can at one and the same time maintain our dignity as black people and affirm the uh, commitments that we have to our nation as patriots. There's no inconsistency between those two things. I don't have to buy a right wing immigration policy in order to affirm my status as a citizen of this great republic. I don't have to sneer when the national anthem is played or the Pledge of Allegiance is recited because some of my ancestors were slaves. To such people, I want to say, grow up. If you don't get rid of the history, you can never have a better future. It's uh, it's really interesting, especially the fact that you can see someone, and if you know one or two things about them, you can predict almost all of their political beliefs. It's it's dangerous. How yeah. do we how do we deal with that going forward in a, in a world that is so much more politicized? Especially at, the U.S. is very much an example of this. Oh, I don't know. I I don't have a big think uh, answer to that one. Um, I was asked. I I actually did a video appearance at a class at Evergreen. State College in Oregon. Ooh. That was the place that uh, that uh, Brett Weinstein got into trouble at when he uh, refused to. Uh, this is the white guy. Uh, he's a, a biologist. He teaches at used to teach at Evergreen, and he got uh, kind of run out of campus on a rail, run off the campus on a rail because he wouldn't participate in the day of absence, which the whites were supposed to stay off campus that day, and it was supposed to be people of color only on campus. And he said, don't tell me whether or not to come to campus based upon me being white. Uh, I, I object. I object to that uh, strenuously. And he held his class and, you know, he got he, he got into a firestorm of protest that eventually drove him and his wife off that campus. They've resigned. And I think they've received a financial settlement from the university for whatever uh, lawsuit that they might have been thinking about bringing. Uh, but in any case, I got called up by um, a professor there and asked if I'd do an appearance in one of his classes by video, which I agreed to do. And we were talking about this very thing. I mean, this class, of course, would not be your typical Evergreen State College class. This would be a class of professors and students who were prepared to question some of the, um, you know, some of the uh, widely held views about diversity and inclusion that you would expect at a place like a radical uh, left wing radical campus like Evergreen State. So these people were not left wing radicals and they wanted to hear from me. And they asked, well, what can you do? Which is kind of a question that you just asked. To which my answer was, I don't know. Uh, my mouth is not a prayer book. That's what my grandmother used to say when I was a kid. My mouth ain't no prayer book, she would say. Uh, and I'm not infallible and I don't have a crystal ball. But I have this conviction that if we don't speak out, we being people who think differently from the norm and who have our own ideas that are critical, like those people in that classroom at Evergreen State whom I was talking to, who regard themselves as pariah when viewed by the larger campus because they have these heterodox ideas. We can't just lie down and let people walk on us. Uh, we can't uh, go into a kind of silent, you know, it's somebody else's problem. Uh, the, if the emperor has no clothes, if you see the naked emperor and this guy's walking around and everybody is acting like he's uh, decked out in the finest garb. But in fact, he's standing before you more or less naked with Trump's uh, fake wig. 
you, you, you have to you have to say something of you. You know, you have to have the courage of your convictions. Otherwise, you shut up. Stop complaining. If you if you're not willing to face um, the mob, <laughs> it's sometimes a mob, uh, then uh, shut up. There's two sides to the mob. Science has become so politicized lately. The one thing that's not supposed to be political is becoming toxic on both sides. How do you think about that and how we can change potentially that, especially with race, with climate change, with gender? I talked at my podcast with a guy um, who's uh, Patrick Brown is his name. He's a postdoc at uh, the um, uh, at a center for scientific studies at Stanford. Uh, I may think of the name of it. But in any case, uh, this guy's a climate scientist. And we were talking about climate change, and I basically wanted to get an education about, you know, what is the what are the basic facts about uh, the changing climate, about the uh, role that human activity plays in it, about the possible remedies for dealing with uh, climate change through regulation of human activity. What do scientists agree about? What things are still open for uh, debate and controversy, and so on. So that was the t- tenor of our conversation. He said something that I thought was quite interesting because I asked about political correctness amongst climate scientists, and he definitely acknowledged that it's there. Uh, We both recalled the um, East Anglia, the University of East Anglia controversy where some emails, the climate gate, where some emails were made public in which climate scientists were basically agreeing among each other that some kinds of findings were helpful to the cause of mobilizing human uh, opposition to climate change through the reduction in the uh, consumption of uh, CO2 producing uh, fuels. Uh, some things were good for that uh, project and some things were bad for that project and they were cutting and dicing and slicing what research would be supported, what research would be reported based upon a judgment about the political impact that that research would have where research that doesn't foster the crusade of mobilizing activity against climate change was regarded as non grata. <clears throat> that was revealed. And I, I called that to Patrick Brown's attention, and he acknowledged that that was indeed the case. But he said there's a countervailing force. And I wonder uh, what you think about this, Matt, the countervailing um, tendency, which is that in science, your fame, your notoriety or your professional success turns on finding things that go against what the community believed to be the case. Scientific revolutions, the great breakthroughs, the way you get a Nobel Prize is by producing research that people didn't think was true until you did it. So if you want to be a famous scientist and you want to get the highest credential, the rewards are huge to going against the consensus if indeed you can prove that the consensus is wrong. True. There is social pressure for conformity among scientists to affirm the consensus, but there's also rewards for those if they can uh, measure up with the proof who can demonstrate that the consensus is not accurate. And he thought that that second force was actually more powerful <clears throat> than the first. So he, Patrick Brown, of uh, postdoc at Stanford, uh, was less concerned that uh, the effect of, uh, of uh, political correctness on climate science would be to shut somebody up and keep secret a finding which actually ran against whatever the consensus of a view of the community might be. There's also infinite funding for research looking the other way. You have all of big oil, all of coal, all of of the right wing looking for any type of excuse they can find. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's absurd that that people believe the earth is flat, but yeah, that's also true. But I wanted to say in the social sciences, I think you have a bigger problem. I mean, I can think of any number of issues. Uh, What is the effect of family structure on child development? Does raising a a child without a father present redound to the detriment in terms of the development of that child? Uh, That's, you know, hugely controversial. Um, Or more uh, prosaic kind of thing is, What's the impact of increasing the minimum wage on the uh, economic well-being of uh, less skilled workers? Or what impact does uh, the large-scale immigration of low-skilled 
workers have on the economic opportunities of disadvantaged uh, incumbent residents of the country. Um, these things are, uh, I mean, even stuff like the tax cut. Uh, the Republicans pass a tax cut, and the question is, is it a tax cut for the rich? And just trying to parse the numbers, who benefits? Everybody's got their story based upon where their, uh, where their political uh, loyalties lie. Uh, everybody's got a different source of data. The Green Eye Shade Economist, <clears throat> I know one of them, his name is Lawrence Kotlikoff. He's a professor at Boston University, and he does this kind of thing for a living, runs these large-scale models assessing the distributional impact of different kind of complicated social policies. He's a Democrat, as it happens, convinced that the Republican-fostered uh, tax bill most recently <clears throat> was probably, on the whole, um, mildly progressive in terms of the incidence of its benefits across income classes. Does that include the repatriation of wealth? Because that's the major, major positive force is that Trump let all of the tech companies bring back like $600 billion from Europe. Yeah, uh, I'm not an expert. I'm sure it does include the capital, uh, the, the effects of people uh, uh, reallocating their, uh, their assets across uh, national boundaries. I know that uh, part of his argument is that by bringing the U.S. corporate tax rate more in line with uh, the international standard, we encouraged uh, foreign investment or the repatriation of funds to the United States. So I think it does include it. It's, it's going to be complicated. A corporation brings back uh, funds and reports it as earnings. And that redounds to the benefits of shareholders. And the shares are not just held by a few people. They're going to be widely held. They're going to be held by pension funds and so forth. Uh, and it also it impacts indirectly customers and workers of the company uh, because, uh, uh, you know, compensation decisions are going to be affected and uh, pricing and product development decisions and so forth. So I can imagine that it could be complicated. And I'm not I'm only giving this as an example. I'm not trying to say that this is the last word on it. Uh, but I'm just saying that the the effort to try to get an answer to what you might think of as a pretty straightforward, objective question is colored by the political interest that people have in what that answer might be. Yeah, it's raining outside. If I'm an optimist, then yes, I can go outside and I don't need to shower. If I'm a pessimist, shit, I can't go to the park. How you think about the world affects your well-being and also affects how you interpret the world. It's a... Uh, it's definitely a major problem. I think the I think the the budget stuff is problematic because of the science behind it. I think the assumption that ha giving companies more money will lead to more jobs is being proven false because companies are worried about the future. We're at a it feels like we're at a peak right now where there's going to be a crash coming in the in the not too distant term. I know. A big, I will be wrong about that. I know my my background is looking at businesses and trends and sixty to, uh, something like sixty to eighty percent of public market CEOs say they would rather um, they would rather forego long term guaranteed profitable investment than have the books look better now so they get their bonuses and it's because they're worried about the future and the bonuses are short term focused. I think that short term bias is really problematic with society. Okay, Matt. I'm, I'm not going to pick a fight with you about that. How do you how do you think about the the justice system? So we talked about single um, single parent households. That's incredibly common, unfortunately, with African Americans, especially being incarcerated for having marijuana, which is now legal in a lot of states. Well, yeah, I think you know the marijuana laws need revision. I, I don't think marijuana is any more harmful a substance than alcohol. I wouldn't make marijuana available to 14 year olds with on demand. You know, I'd, I'd have a similar kind of regulatory regime as we have with alcohol. But um, I, you know, I mean, not only are there valid uses of marijuana in terms of medical and, you know, there's plenty of evidence about that. But even for recreational purposes, uh, it's less, uh, you know, bad. It's less hard on the liver and uh, uh, it's less uh, uh, implicated in, uh, uh, you know, automobile fatalities, and uh, I would bet less uh, implicated in domestic abuse and things like that that are exacerbated by alcohol. I need statistics to back that up, but I'm pretty sure they'd be easy to find. Uh, and, you know, the prohibition, I mean, the history of prohibition on marijuana is tainted with all kinds of uh, racist, anti-Mexican, anti-black uh, superstition and whatnot. 
Um, and as you point out, the states are, uh, are liberalizing their laws across the boards. So I don't know how many, but dozens of states now have either medical marijuana or they've allowed marijuana to be uh, uh, available on commercial uh, terms to under some regulatory regime. Uh, that's the obviously the direction that we're moving in. Marijuana prohibition is uh, dying a slow, painful death. Uh, I saw um, a... Uh, uh, who was it? Somebody, a former uh, Republican attorney general who had an op-ed piece uh, calling for the federal government to legalize marijuana on the argument that uh, the federal law should not be in conflict with so many states that are moving toward liberalization. Let the feds get out of the way and let the states decide for themselves what they want to do. Uh, I don't think that marijuana uh, enforcement, which is uh, noxious in my view, is the major or even uh, a significant factor in looking at the extent of incarceration in the country or at the racial disparity in incarceration. Um, I, I, I think that the anti-drug war of the 1980s, of the Reagan years and following, are was implicated in this upswelling of punitive sentiment, longer sentences, mandatory minimums and whatnot, uh, that are part of the process that led to mass incarceration, the war on drugs, this crusade against uh, against uh, illicit substances is a part of the cultural, social, political dynamic that led to us having two and a quarter million people under lock and key. And there was a time when uh, the growth in imprisonment was largely being driven by people being locked up, not so much for marijuana, but for cocaine and heroin and methamphetamines and whatnot, trafficking in uh, in those substances. Um, but uh, I, I forgot what your question is. I just got off on marijuana, which I think should be legal, uh, but which I don't think, even though it's now not legal everywhere, is the major factor in accounting for how many people are in prison. What was your question? Just really your thoughts on the broken incentives, the system of prisons. You covered a bit of it. Yeah, I mean, and we're so much unlike other places in the world, it ought to make us stop and think. Uh, they're somehow able to run a society in Germany or France or even the United Kingdom, which has a pretty high incarceration rate, but is dramatically lower than our own, or in Scandinavia. These are, you know, in some ways comparable societies to our own. They don't have the same demographic profile, but they are uh, wealthy, they are capitalist, they are democratic uh, uh, countries and they have crime issues. They, you know, there's, it's not as if they, they don't have anything like the gun crime and violence that we have in the United States, but they have property crime up the wazoo just like we do or even worse. And they don't have anything nearly as many people in prison. And their attitude toward what you do with someone when you put them in prison is really quite different. Uh, much more of a humane, if you will, developmental focus. They know that people are coming through, they're going to be getting out. Uh, things like that. You don't see uh, solitary confinement being used as a dis disciplinary device in the penal systems of these countries. You don't see capital punishment uh, in these countries. You don't see uh, juveniles being sentenced to life without the possibility of parole uh, in these countries. Uh, you don't see 20 year sentences for, you know, 25 years to life for three felonies and things like that. Sentences are shorter. Uh, uh, conditions of imprisonment are, are less draconian. Uh, and so on. Uh, you don't so much, although I, perhaps things are changing with the rising nationalist uh, parties on the right in some of these countries, but you don't so much see a politics of lock them up where the politician is running to promise the electorate that he's going to be or she the toughest one you've ever seen in terms of dealing with crime and criminals, uh, which we have had here. Yeah, imagine, so, imagine if you had police officers ticketing you for going one mile an hour over. If you incentivized them to write tickets, that's what happens. Well, yeah, that's true, but you ought to, you ought to challenge that or something. I mean, one mile over, that's, that's kind of... But, you know, they have tremendous authority, you're right. And if you incentivize them to take to discretion, is what I mean to say, they have tremendous discretion. Uh, you could probably lock up everybody if you penalize people for going one mile over the speed limit. The the only constraint would be the number of police officers and the number of cruisers on the road, because a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people are driving uh, above the speed limit. That gives the officer discretion about who he's going to stop, which can sometimes be abused. Yeah. Eventually, you get to the gulag system like USSR. What technology are you most excited about that's upcoming? Well, you're talking to the wrong guy. I'm an old fogey 
what I mean, I, you know, I don't even know what technologies I can name. What are you worried about then? Uh, uh, now, the easy answer here, I'm an economist. I'd have to say automation and, you know, the disappearance of work. What's the future of work going to look like? Robots displacing people and all of that. Uh, on the one hand, this is an old idea in economics that technological innovation that drives people out of their incumbent niches in the economy is a good thing on the whole over the long run because those resources end up getting reallocated and rededicated, although it's a painful thing in the short run for the people who have to bear the adjustment. I used to be a, a you know guy that put uh, shoes on horses and then the automobile came along and now my services as a blacksmith are no longer required. Uh, I'm in trouble. I better learn another skill. That's a major disruptive event in my life. But having automobiles come along is not a bad thing from the point of view of humanity overall. One might think climate issues to the side. Uh, likewise, uh, robotics and all the artificial intelligence and all uh, need not be a disaster, even though it certainly will mean a lot of pain and a lot of adjustment for people who are going to be thrown out of work. Uh, hopefully, I'm not one of them. Hopefully, college professors will not become automated so that there's just one computer program somewhere that fashions the lectures for every student who's learning at a distance, and people like me won't any longer be useful. Or at least give me another 10 years. That's all I ask. <laughs> Perfect. At least if we're going to have it, you might as well you might as well get your get your deal. I mentioned Yuval Harari, and uh, he is a, you know he does paint a sort of dystopian picture about what technical innovation might lead to in uh, a number of respects. One having having to do with um, the inequality of access to the benefits from, uh, for example, life extending technology. And so the emergence of a class of people whose lives are really radically different from other classes of people because they can think about living for 150 years because they can afford and have access to life extending uh, disease re repressing uh, technical innovations, which, while in principle available to everybody, as a practical matter, will be available only to the wealthy. So that, that's that's one kind of thing uh, to worry about. I mean, I, I think we don't know what you know. This communications revolution, where uh, I mean, you know, within my lifetime, I mean, I now I travel around the world. I go to India. I go to Europe. Wherever I go, I can be in touch with anybody anywhere, except perhaps China, where I have to get past some wall in order to be in touch with somebody. But I mean, the censors have not been able to shut down global communication between billions of people spread out all over the planet. And the networks that are uh, engendered by that and the, the dynamics of identity that might emerge from that and the possibility of undermining conventional national kinds of boundaries because people are able to find each other and communicate with each other and cooperate with each other uh, across these lines. That's a that's a brave new world of uh, possibilities that I think we can only guess at. It definitely is. I think with I, I definitely agree with you, Val, but at the same time, for him to sell books, it's not exactly exciting if you say everything's going to be rosy and good and easy and not that different than today but I, I i'm very much of his opinion in terms of where we're headed i think it's problematic glenn i got one last question for you and that is we brought up autom we brought up automation a little bit what are your thoughts on the future of the economy in terms of a ubi or some other type of system if automation really comes quickly and we're having issues dealing with it I think UBI is a bad idea, although if I was just talking about poverty, you know, and I was trying to, you know, put a floor underneath poor people so that they had a basic income for living and whatnot, where I'm encouraging people not to have that as a way of life, but to move as a, you know, have that as a transitional support while they're able to find some way in order to be self-supporting. And I'd be quite happy to see public funds invested in education and training for people to be able to make it on their own and a floor underneath their standard of living during a transition period, that's one thing. But the idea that, I don't know, uh, this may be a caricature of one of the oil-rich Gulf states where there's a huge amount of revenue coming in because you're selling petroleum and you've got a relatively small population and uh, there's enough to kind of give everybody $50,000 a year or $100,000 a year as an entitlement uh, and uh, you don't break the budget in doing so, 
and it at least lets people share in the wealth of the country, but then they don't have to do anything. I, I worry that that would be soul killing. Uh, I, I worry that uh, an entitlement that says, listen, we got a bunch of robots and they got everything in hand. They're producing everything. OK, we don't really need your labor services anymore. But we but you're, you're a human being and that's a robot. I care about you. That's a machine. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to pay you off. I'm going to make sure that you've got an income coming in. Now, what you do with your time, well, that's on you. Now you've got 24 hours a day of leisure, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Uh, that should be a good thing, right? And I worry that it wouldn't be such a good thing. Uh, and this, this just may be a failure of imagination on my part. Maybe people liberated from the nine to five routine and the requirements of having to work for a living will find other ways of devoting their time that will enhance human welfare in, in a manner that I can't yet now imagine. But um, mastery over craft, acquiring a capacity to do something of value, uh, uh, the, the self-satisfaction you get from <laughs> putting in a day's work <laughs> and being able to see the fruit of your labor. Uh, Maybe I romanticize what work is. Work is drudgery. Work is your back is hurting. Work is having to get out of the bed at six o'clock in the morning. Work is having to put up with uh, recalcitrant and, and uh, uh, arrogant uh, customers. Uh, work is pain. Work is sweat. Why wouldn't I be delighted to see people liberated from the need to do that? Um, you know, I'm, I'm worried about people being bored. Uh, I'm worried about people's uh, having no purpose. Um, I'm, I'm worried about uh, the diminishment of the edge of the edge in human endeavor that comes from struggling uh, to try to, to make your way and to try to get ahead. Uh, I think it might be a, a, a mistake, actually, to think that technology can liberate people. Uh, so that, uh, that, you know, we're all going to live in this uh, uh, in this uh, wonderful land where nobody has to worry about getting up at seven o'clock in the morning and get to their work. If I gave you five million dollars and banned you from working for the rest of your life, what would you do? Uh, I wouldn't take it. If you talk about me, I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't trade. Banned you from working for an employer for the rest of your life. <clears throat> Okay. You can still do what you want. You can still run the podcast, have interesting conversations, write papers, can but you I don't have to. Can I an account? <laughs> do what? Uh, can I get patrons to listen to it on uh, the internet so that uh, they, if people want to give me money, they can give it to me because they like my podcast? Yeah, you can still do that. I don't see why not. <laughs> uh, can I sell my books if I write them? I don't see why not. It's not a job. Okay. And if I want to invite students to my home and hold forth lectures and so forth, uh, I'm free to do that. You are, but make sure you're not doing any solo ones that could be questionable. <laughs> okay. I might want to negotiate with you on the $5 million. It might be more like $15 million, but I'm, I'm prepared to consider it. Okay. So it sounds like it at least could possibly be interesting. Glenn, I've had you on here for a while. I want to thank you for coming on. Okay. One last thing. What would you leave people with? Quote, call to action, et cetera. Oh, Matthew. You should have you should have warned me that you're going to ask me that question before you asked me to it. Spontaneous, you always Spontaneous. get the real answers. <coughs> Read books. <laughs> Read books spoken like a true professor. I like or a true uh, I like it. I Read. like it. <laughs> Read books. Someone else has had your problem before. Glenn, where's the now, best don't, place? Don't just do this. Read books. Read now. It's okay if you have the novel on your device. Okay, I get it. I get devices are very handy. And, you know, I'm a, I, I subscribe to these services, too, where I can uh, go and download the uh, books and read them on. And I even listen to them sometimes, you know, the audio. Um, but, uh, man, there's more under the sun than you can even imagine. And the only way you're going to know about it is if you read books. Exactly. That's a good place to close.